Welcome everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. Fridays are some of our favorite days because it's ask and answered. And every Friday we get to get one of the brain trust folks from Fundraising Academy to come with us and explore the questions that people send in, tweet in, I guess we should say X in, um, ask on the street. I was part of a panel this week, Muhi, uh, for something unrelated to the nonprofit show. And somebody asked me um, during this panel, or like at the end of the panel, came up to me and said, hey, can you put this question on an upcoming episode? Don't put my name, but ask this question. I mean, so you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a fun thing. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Been joined today by Muli Kawaja, trainer from Fundraising Academy, and also, interestingly enough, the co-founder of the American Muslim Community Foundation, which we are going to get him on to just specifically talk about his journey with that community foundation and, and what that looks like and, and um, how he's been able to integrate his knowledge and work with Fundraising Academy into that as uh, somebody that's had to go out and pound the pavement. So. Um, we're really looking forward to that, and, and uh, we will rope him into that shortly. You know, the, the American uh, Nonprofit Academy started the nonprofit show at the outside, the onset, really, of the pandemic. And most of these sponsors said yes that first week. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, where Muhi joins us from, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. If you've missed any of our 900, nearly 900 episodes, or you want to share them, check us out. We have a fabulous app. You can catch us on uh, streaming broadcast portals, wherever you like to engage uh, with that, or in podcast format. So we will be with you wherever you are. Okay, my friend, ready for the first question. This is a doozy. Such an interesting question. I am the board liaison and am having issues with older board members who can't use our meeting technology and board portal. Do you have any suggestions that can help us get to our older board members up to date so they can be up to date? Big question. I, I swear to you, I, I do a lot of work about uh, board liaisons and board work. I get this question all the time and it's a it's a deep frustration. Yeah, so I'll have two things I'll share. You know, um, just having moved back to Michigan after traveling all this time, I'm now back with my parents uh, for a few months, and it's a great time, um, really is. And I am their IT tech person, right? I am connecting the internet. Uh, I'm making sure their devices are up to date and i am making sure they can print wirelessly mm -hmm. um, all, of the, all of the things right so <laughs> times it just takes that hand-holding approach and saying why don't we grab a coffee we'll log you in i'll show you how to access everything now if there's resistance there that's a whole other issue right um, but, you know, similarly at AMCF, we have a board member who's, you know, probably in his 50s, not even that old, I would say, and just still, you know, getting into the Gmail environment, getting into Slack, mm -hmm. two-factor authorization, oh my goodness, like all of these things, right? <laughs> so it it happens and it sometimes it takes weeks and months to figure it out but uh you just gotta make that extra effort um to tiny loose ends and see what are the challenges in the technology in the portal um and how can they make the user experience easier for people who may have some challenges with technology you know, I agree with you. And I, it's interesting because, you know, Nancy comes from Palo Alto. And that's the, you know, the pretty much the yeah. point <laughs> of Silicon Valley. Definitely and so is. yeah. isn't that isn't that interesting? And I would imagine yeah. if Nancy had written in from like Denver or Cincinnati or, 
you know, I don't know where, it might be a little different uh, sense because she's probably in a in an environment where things are all tech all the time, super high functioning. And then it doesn't take that much not to be functioning with some of these new portals and stuff. And so I really like what you said. It's not a one and done thing. You can't just like meet up and say, okay, here's how you do it. Boom, 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 boom. You're going to have to kind of work with them on a journey, build some comp uh, confidence. Um, I find that with um, my mom, when I'm helping her with, uh, you know, with tech, um, and I am the same way, uh, I like to write everything down. I like to write the steps down so that I can go back to my notes and refer to it. It's not a, you know, quick, I'll just show you and it's going to be, you know, seated in the brain. So it is a process. Now, I agree with you, or I'm, I'm kind of curious before we move on to the next question. If you do have somebody who's resistant and says, why can't you just send me, you know, snail mail me the board packet? We did that for years and that was fine. What do you, how do you navigate that? <laughs> so I think the navigating challenging board members is a whole other beast in and of itself right uh it's the personalities involved maybe you're just not the best person on the staff to deal with it okay. um put in somebody else on the you know tag team get them into the ring yeah. uh have them jump off the top ropes and suplex the board member in a very gentle way right <laughs> so See what you can do to manage egos, manage personalities, um, learn the psychology of the uh, board member. We talk a lot at Fundraising Academy about um, social styles and what type of you know personality the board member has. Um, so that's something to look into and see who is the best person on your staff or maybe do a joint approach with the board member who is providing this resistance and get down to the crux of it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a very wise thing is to um, embrace that concept of social style and how you communicate. And I, I appreciate what you said. You know, you, the board, the board liaison that writes in Nancy may not be the, the best person to navigate this and to own it and say, okay, how do we pull somebody in? And how do we allow somebody to champion this process? Because you're going to have to, you're going to have to get through it. Absolutely. Well, really interesting, Nancy. We wish you luck. Um, I feel your pain, sister. I really do. Because I've been there and it's tough. Okay, let's move on to, oh, you know, my favorite name withheld from Tampa, Florida. We had a major donor call us about a new donor who they think is not a quote unquote nice person from our community. The older donor who has always been supportive made some alarming declarations about this new donor help. Wow. Yeah. You know, alarming declarations um, that causes me to pause. Mm -hmm. Is it things around how they earn their wealth? Is it things around their personality? Is it things about their political stance in the community? Um, is it things about how they treat others? Um, is it, you know, around allegations of misconduct in the workplace or personally, professionally? Um, yeah, there's a lot that is undisclosed, but I think the best way to um, receive this is to thank the older donor for their concern um, and let them know that you've taken note of it, uh, but then proceed with um, a grain of salt in approaching the new donor um, and maybe just have that in the back of your mind, but don't let it affect the relationship with the nonprofit unless it is really alarming. Uh, and then you can make a decision is this somebody's gift that we don't want to accept because their values don't align with our values? Um, so I could see both sides of it, but I would just 
kind of do the politically correct thing in this situation um, and assess it for yourself before making a um, straight on decision just based on the older donors inclinations. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done that? Like where you quote unquote refund the, the, the money or extricate yourself from a donor? And could you maybe share that journey without disclosing who it was? Cause Yeah, this is a so dicey thing. yeah, no, um, I've, I've been in conversations where donors have offered support um, and before they gave had to decline based on alignment of the gift and what they were expecting. Um, not necessarily because they were a bad person and we didn't want to accept their money, but it just wasn't good alignment or fit. with the vision and mission of the organization and what the donor was hoping to achieve with the gift. And it was actually better placed at another nonprofit. And I gave them references to that nonprofit and they actually end up giving a gift to the other nonprofit um, that strengthened the relationship with the donor. Oddly enough, um, the other nonprofit was appreciative of the recommendation um, as a philanthropic advisor Uh, it allowed me to gain more respect with the donor because uh, I could have easily accepted the money, Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but then it became this friendship advisor relationship going forward. Um, and uh, they often ask me like, hey, I'm thinking of setting up a scholarship for this or, hey, I'm thinking of building wells in... developing countries what are your thoughts on this organization or so they just come back to me for advice on on this and they're not even a donor advice fund holder at amcf this is just like somebody who they really should be right uh and <laughs> yeah you know, so that's the thing yeah so two things come to mind if you think about that the cause selling cycle that fundraising academy works on you know the very two first pieces are discovery um research really looking you know you're you're no you're not even thinking about asking you're trying to really determine if the fit is good and if the, if this is can be a long-term relationship and um so i'm i'm fascinated you must have done that somehow because you said before they ever gave you were you were having this discussion about the alignment it wasn't a oh crap we we cashed the check and we spent the money and now what are we going to do? I mean, right. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I kind of wish I was in that scenario where I did accept a gift and later had to have a tough conversation with the donor saying, you know, you gave this as an unrestricted gift. Mm -hmm. And then now you're saying after the fact, you want it to go towards X, Y, and Z. Right. Um, let's have these conversations prior to you giving. Like, I'd love to have that conversation with a donor as a teaching moment to share like, you can't be giving with strings attached. Um, and also hopefully being able to then benefit the organization still in unrestricted giving. Um, so I can see it go both ways and I can play a hard line on behalf of the organization and on behalf of the donor. So um, yeah, but I definitely agree having these discovery meetings asking the right questions, getting clarity on what they want to support and matching that with the mission and vision of the organization is super critical. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, you know, to take this to the next level, I've personally been involved, uh, as a board member with a named, uh, part of a camp of a large campus for our, for our nonprofit where something untoward happened with the naming right the person who a, a, a big part of our campus was named after and um there wasn't what we used to call the bad boy clause in the mou in the memo of understanding where the contract that spelled out how you extricate yourself from from certain things tough lesson learned because it ended up being played out in the media Yeah. And another reason why gift agreements are so important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's like a whole nother thing. Well, name withheld. I think, um, we has given you some great advice 
and uh, hopefully we will help you along that journey check back in with us davida from colorado springs colorado writes who takes the lead in making sure that board members fulfill their board service requirements we have some on the board who say it is the board chair and others think it is the ceo we could use some guidance on this uh, you know Muhi, when i first got this um i thought it was probably more like the um give or get meeting attendance, you know, filling tables at certain events, you know, so I'm thinking that's part of that board service requirement and who monitors and who, who manages and, and who enforces it. Who's the hammer that comes down on that board member? It's a good question. Yeah. Uh, Davida, it'd be helpful to know what's your role within the organization. Are you a board member? Are you that's a true. staff member, a CDO? someone on the development team uh, or the CEO yourself. So, um, you know, part of me wants to say the onus is on the board member themselves. They should be signing an agreement. They should be understanding what the requirements are. Uh, the bylaw should clearly dictate what these requirements are for the organization and board members knowing their term limit, what the uh, minimum gift uh, that they're giving should be and how they show up and serve on committees uh, within the organization. So if they, and we have had board turnover at AMCF, we have had low engagement at other boards that I've been part of at organizations. Um, people love to help, but they also bite off more than they can chew. Yes. That's just common fact. Right. And, I think working with these board members should be a joint effort because the board chair is likely their peer. The CEO reports to the board. Right. Right. So they can have some authority uh, in the situation, but I think the board chair really needs to lead by example mm -hmm. and enforce the requirements. Um, the advice can come from the CEO, yes, and maybe stronger in a joint way, but it won't be as effective if the board chair is not owning it in some way as well. Yeah, I, I kind of fall along the same lines as you. I mean, first and foremost, this needs to be structured, communicated, laid out, and there needs to be an, an agreement. And those agreements, I believe, should be managed every December Prior to the next year, a lot of organizations wait until January and then it's like March by the time, by the time everything comes in. It's like, no, do it the year before so everybody understands moving forward for the year. And, you know, Muhi, you've heard me talk about it. Um, I'm a big, big proponent of a board liaison. And so I agree. I think that the board chair is the one responsible for this. Um, but the board liaison should be that person tracking it and doing the gentle reminder or asking, you know, where folks are, um, you know, that kind of a thing, especially if you have an organization. I was working with somebody um, last week and they told me they ran five boards. So they had the main, you know, board of directors and then they had basically auxiliary boards. Right. And I was just like, I actually said, well, kill me now. I don't know how you can do your work and run that many boards and have all these, you know, filtering aspects of what they need to be doing um, without some sort of major support. Um, so, yeah, it's a very interesting question and it needs to be spelled out, I think, also, you know, um, ahead of the game. So everybody knows whose responsibility it is and they can navigate it so it doesn't get to be a bigger problem, right? At the end of the year, you're like, yeah. wow, Sally, you were supposed to have done this, 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 and that, and you didn't. It's a little late, right? Definitely. And I think AMCF has our annual meeting. So this is exactly when we do that. We bring the whole board together. They review the bylaws, the articles of incorporation, this, uh, and anything internal. So this is exactly dealt with at that time. Then we have a separate retreat for the strategic plan, and we do that annually as well. So two different meetings, two different agendas, 
one is more internally focused, the other is externally focused, mm -hmm. um, but both super critical uh, to the organization's health. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Davida, good luck. I think this is a really important thing to, um, you know, navigate and to understand and to manage because otherwise you get a lot of hurt feelings and you get people that get really cranky and then you're not working on the mission. You're working on something that's kind of an internal function that should have been managed. So anyway, okay. Now this is an interesting, interesting question. And this doesn't happen very often, but somebody wrote in a question for you, my friend, Muhi Kwaja. Muhi, I've been watching you for a while on the nonprofit show. My question is this, how long did it take for you to build confidence and become such a strong fundraiser? Oh, that's so nice, Steve. Um, thank you so much for writing in and watching. Um, you know, part I, I feel like I've always had a strong sense of um, organizational skill, leadership skill, dating back to like high school and just being involved <laughs> um, in different sports, different clubs. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I have to give credit to being like the youngest of four siblings. So having older siblings that showed me what it was like um, being in those leadership positions. Um, I have to thank like my mentors along the way, Jack Alata, who's been on the show mm -hmm. frequently, um, and many others who've um, uplifted me and gave me the confidence to be a strong fundraiser. Um, and then role models like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and Muhammad Ali, um, fierce, strong voices uh, for social justice. Mm -hmm. um, and people still with us today, like Linda Sarsour and Rashida Tlaib um, and so many others. So I think, you know, I give it back to, to them. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was, you know, ever since my first job right out of college at the University of Michigan through Development Summer Internship Program, that was so foundational and critical for me in building my confidence as a fundraiser uh, and my mentor there, Kat Walsh. So yeah, I would say have mentors uh, who have the confidence and are strong fundraisers because who you surround yourself with will reflect who you become. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I think it goes back to the people that I've surrounded myself with. Um, and one other leader that I'll give a shout out to is Farhan Latif. Um, he was with me at University of Michigan. Um, he's now the president foundation at El Hibri Foundation. Um, so just kind of like seeing this trajectory of these people in their career and reaching out to them every few months and just picking their brain. And um, yeah, but my whole experience from the small nonprofits, I've been a one person development team. Mm -hmm. at to the Red Cross, where I was a frontline fundraiser uh, as a major gift officer for five years. So it's like a lot of it's experiential as well um, and having the opportunity to be in those places. So what I hear you say, two things, it's like you probably had something like it was a part of your makeup, you know, and as a child moving through, but is it fair to say that you're not fully baked, that you're you're still, you know, building confidence or do you feel like, no, you've got this. It's just a matter of doing what you know you're supposed to do. Yeah. You know, thing? cause it's like, yeah, it seems like you're still taking in, um, advice and in, in that piece. Yeah, for sure. And okay. imposter syndrome is real. Like the last mm -hmm. year and a half, like I stepped away from AMCF a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had an ED, they just resigned a few months ago. So now I'm stepping back in and owning what is there and the opportunity and everything that comes with that. Uh, and I think that um, I'm a lifelong learner. I'm always going to have a mentor. I'll always mentee. I'll always be a mentor to somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, and I learn a lot through that experience. Mm -hmm. So I definitely think that uh, you have to stay hungry uh, if you want to be a, mm -hmm. uh, lifelong learner and just somebody who's making a difference yeah it's cool i i like that because i 
when I read that question, I thought it's going to be like a, a specific time frame. I needed three years. I needed six years and seven months or whatever. But I, I appreciate the that it's a journey and it's a continual, it's a flow and it's there's not like a hard baked answer um, to that. So that's cool. Well, um, you know, I love chatting with you, Muhi, because I feel like you um, you bring a different perspective of what it takes to be in this in, uh, environment, how you navigate, you know, different things professionally, um, personally. You've always been very transparent in your your own personal journey, and and as a man of faith, I love all that that blend and so it's been really cool and it continues to be cool muhi kawaja um, a trainer with fundraising academy um, co-founder of the american muslim community foundation such an interesting journey that you've taken and that you continue to do um, in the green room chatter you were talking about all of the amazing places that you've been just in the last like 15 days it seems like you know talking and serving on panels and sharing your knowledge and your wisdom so we thank you for that, Muki, from our sector. It's, it's really a, a powerful thing that you do and that you share. Um, again, we oh, want to thank. Oh, it's 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 amazing. I always get to put. I always put myself on when you're going to be on. I'm always like, I want to do. I want to be the one that talks with him because I'm fascinated. Um, hey, everybody, we have amazing sponsors: Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader. Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. And, you know, I know Muhi knows this, but but you as our viewer or listener might not realize. These amazing sponsors of ours, um, they don't exert any editorial control. So we can talk about what it is we feel like we need to talk about. I mean, Mui, you, you made the comment early on in today's episode about unrestricted funding. And in some ways, our sponsors are like that to us. They, they trust us and, um, and we, we get to really chat day in and day out across the board, so many different things. And so that's really an amazing thing that they partner with us. So, Muhi, it is now Friday, as Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd, would say. Um, we're going to hopefully get some rest, and then we will hit it hard again on Monday. And as we like to end every episode of The Nonprofit Show, we want to remind our viewers, listeners, our guests, and ourselves to stay well so you can do well. Muhi, thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend.